Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, this is Adam Sotok, and I am the Public Engagement Director with NC Child. And uh, welcome, everyone, to this session. The session is How to Center Race, Racial Equity in Community Organizing. Thanks so much for joining us and being a part of our virtual 2020 Kids Conference. Uh, I'll introduce our speakers here in just a moment, but before I do, I've got some quick housekeeping uh, instructions for everyone. So, the session is completely bilingual in English and Spanish, and we have a live interpreter on the line. So what everybody needs to do is you need to go to the bottom of your screen and choose either Spanish or the English channel to hear the audio. And you can, you, you can do that by looking for the image of a globe and the word interpretation. Um, and then you click on uh, either Spanish or English. Um, if you choose the Spanish channel, you will hear the interpreter speaking in Spanish. You will also be able to hear the English language presenters at a low volume in the background. If you do not want to hear English in the background, you can click on the globe icon again and choose mute original audio. So presenters, um, well, th this part uh, was if we were having live presentations, but since we have a pre-recorded session, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the pre-recording and how this is gonna go. Um, so we have a lot of participants on this webinar, yay, people that are ready to hear more about this important topic and ask good questions. Um, but that means that we do have everyone on mute to preserve the audio quality. So um, we have pre-recorded this session, uh, with, and it's a great session. I've, I've had the, the pleasure of already watching it. But during the session, we do have a couple of our presenters here with us. And so you'll be able to um, live, uh, ask any questions live by using the Q&A and a tab at the bottom of the screen. So you can just type your question into the Q&A box and um, our presenters can maybe try to respond to that. And you can also put general comments or resources in the chat box as we go throughout the recording as well. We will hopefully have a little time at the end of this for some Q&A and live discussion after the video recording runs. Um, the session was recorded ahead of time. So you're about to see a video of the presentations. And um, finally, I wanted to mention that the session is being recorded and the video will be available over the next week or two in both English and Spanish. And we will send you an email when all the recorded sessions are available, okay? So um, without any further ado, I'm now going to introduce the three wonderful presenters who are gonna be, you'll be seeing on the recording. First, we have Tina Sherman, who's with us here. She is a campaign director for the breastfeeding and paid leave campaigns at Moms Rising. Um, Tina is one of our panelists. Bridget Flaherty is also with us, and Bridget is a co-director of Down Home North Carolina, an organizing project led by the working people of North Carolina's small towns and rural communities. And we also have on the video uh, Lenora Smith, and Lenora is the executive director of the Partnership Effort for Advancement of Children's Health, that's PEACH, which is located in Durham, North Carolina. And um, as I mentioned, all three of, of our presenters are on this pre-recorded video talking about how to center racial equity and community organizing. And we are going to get that started right now. Thank you so much for joining us for this session on how to center race equity in community organizing. I know all of you ladies um, bring so much to the table. So um, let's jump into this conversation. Um, I guess I wanna get started just by asking, what is community organizing to you? You wanna share with us, Tina? Yes, um, absolutely. Thank you so much. So first of all, my name is Tina Sherman and I'm with Moms Rising. And when we think about community organizing, we really thinking about centering the voices 
of um, those individuals who are most affected um, by whatever monetizing works in public policy. So whatever policy we are um, looking at um, enacting or advocating for, um, we really want to make sure that we're bringing the voices of um, the families, the individuals um, who are most impacted, most directly impacted. Um, and so really working within those communities, um, making sure that um, we're bringing um, <clears throat> the variety of voices, um, whether it's, you know, in Moms Rising, we're working from a parental perspective. So whether it's a single parent or um, uh, uh, you know, dual, uh, dual family, dual income family. Um, also, you know, we particularly want to make sure that we're um, engaging with folks from different backgrounds, um, different, um, different races, want to make sure that we are really um, engaging with um, those who the policy will most directly affect. I'm happy to go next. Um, my name is Bridget Flaherty. Uh, I'm with Down Home North Carolina. Uh, we are a statewide grassroots organization that works to build power for multiracial rural communities um, across North Carolina. And for us, community organizing, you know, we have a principle in Down Home where we say, if you've lived it, you lead it. And I think that really builds off of what Tina was saying in terms of, you know, we know that this economic and racial and gender system was never built for working class folks. Um, and community organizing is really about building the leadership of poor and working people across race to um, come into power. Um, it's leadership for what, and the what that we also say in Down Home is about you know, rebuilding our economy so that money isn't just going to the top um, and that we actually have redistribution down to the people who have actually built this country and has built North Carolina. We talk about restoring democracy. Um, you know, we know that voting has been under attack. Political representation has also been sort of centered um, really with white men um, for a very long time. And so we need, we need a politics, we need a government that looks like us and has been led by people who understand what it means to have your lights turned off, um, who work in wage jobs, you know, um, who had no jobs at all because they've been locked out. Um, and then we talk about ending white supremacy um, because again, that way that race um, has uh, been in this country uh, has just been detrimental um, in terms of, again, economic opportunities for folks across race, um, health opportunities, um, just, just the, the air that we breathe and the, the days, you know, the, or what our daily lives look like. And so community organizing is really about uh, transforming those systems, building leadership, um, and um, just knowing that people know the solutions. And so getting people to start taking action um, so that they have lives that are dignified um, and uh, honestly also more joy. <laughs> That's so important. Yeah, um, and when I think of community organizing, especially from the perspective of um, the partnership effort for the advancement of children's health, you know, we really got into community organizing because of the necessity for answers to questions. And so one of the questions we were looking at had to do with housing, it had to do with health, it had to do with um, how older housing impacted the health of residents who lived in the older housing. And that's how we came to this um, community organizing opportunity. And we looked at it from the perspective that um, when you listen to the community voices, there's a common theme. And that common theme that community residents share usually runs from housing, it's jobs, it becomes crime issues, law enforcement type issues, um, the environment. Those become themes that run through community organizing issues. And, and we learn more through each generation and we're able to tackle it in a different, new, more aggressive and informed way. But when we 
think about it, we really came from the perspective that the community said, hey, our housing isn't safe. Hey, we need jobs. Um, hey, our education, how come our children aren't faring well in school? And we came to it from that perspective. How do we provide solutions to some of those, like those recurring questions in the community? So it seems like really the common thread for community organizing for all of you is really going back to the people, um, mm -hmm. going back to communities and um, making sure those communities inform the policies that affect them. Um, Nothing. So, oh, I'm sorry. Say that again. No, go on, Tina. Say that I again. Was, I was going to say that the, the idea of nothing for us without us. Um, the answer is always within the community. Um, and to think or to try to proceed otherwise only sets um, everyone up for failure. Yeah, and I really think that's important because um, I think for me, when I started coming on to co doing community outreach work, honestly, I had, I was surrounded by like the grandmother types, the um, those people who had time to, I, I will say disposable time, discretionary time that they could um, use for addressing issues in their community. And now what's so exciting, I mean, just really liberating about what's happening are the younger people that are fueling this movement and those messages like that, nothing for us, without us, those are, and I think we probably thought about it in the same way. Uh, I, we thought about it, but we weren't able to articulate it in the same way that these young people um, of today, they have that message, they, they really press it, and they have the knowledge and they know how to do the research and gather the information to support, and sub which is necessary to convince public officials that, you, that there is a need and they hone it and they hit it and they do such a good job with it. And I'm so excited when young people um, are at the table getting involved and actually creating these movements. So do you feel like your organizing efforts um, across um, across the, the span of all the um, services that you may offer or the things that you do to um, uplift your communities, um, do you feel like there are things that are already built in um, to help build racial equity? Bridget, do you think you would like to share on that? Sure, yeah. Um, you know, when I think about down homes work on expanding Medicaid, for instance, um, there is such a real connection between um, expanding access to health care and the fight for racial justice. You know, when you're taking on an issue um, like health care, it's intersected and intersects with racial justice and racial equity because how health care has been built is it's been built off of inequity. Who has access to health care? Um, you know, uh, who is able to be able to have insurance, you know, these are all racial justice issues. And by being able to pass Medicaid expansion in North Carolina, you're actually expanding access for people of color, for low income folks to literally get a right that they should already have. You know, we know that in North Carolina, um, the majority of folks who are uninsured are black and brown communities. We know there is a geographic region. A lot of that is out, um, you're seeing a concentration of that out east. Um, a lot of the states uh, that haven't expanded are also, it's regional, it's, it's southern, you know? And so if we're actually able to, like I said, expand Medicaid and that fight for it, you're really improving black and brown lives, as well as, again, folks who are living in the rural south, since that's where the healthcare crisis has really hit the hardest. Um, I'll also say that, you know, healthcare has become weaponized on the right. And yeah. Yeah. you look at that in a couple of ways. Um, right now, with um, the way that talking about healthcare has somehow become a political issue around, 
you know, um, if undocumented immigrants get it and if undocumented immigrants get it, you know, we don't want this right to expand. I mean, you have to fight on anti-immigrant bias and you have to fight on uh, notions of who deserve it from honestly, like even a white supremacist lens. Um, and uh, two things I'll say around that. So, um, you know, we really believe that everybody deserves health care in down home. And yet we were seeing that when we were trying to talk about this, um, there was in, in, in some of the rural communities that some people were saying, yes, I want to expand health care and I want to fight for it, but not if undocumented immigrants get it. And we were sort of like really curious, like, where is this coming from? Mm -hmm. So we did a hearts and mind um, canvas around this, also called a race class canvas, where we knocked on over a thousand doors in the fall of 2019. And we talked to people about, do you support healthcare, the expansion of healthcare? And they said yes. And then we asked, well, do you support healthcare if it were to be extended to undocumented immigrants? And then we just hung with them on the doors. We wanted to have real conversations with people about their feelings of uh, scarcity, their feelings of race. And by listening to people and actually trying to poke holes, honestly, in some of the Fox News rhetoric that people were getting, we mm -hmm. actually saw a great shift. So when we talked about people, well, actually, do you know an immigrant? And they would say, yes. We're like, well, tell me about that relationship. Mm -hmm. And they would actually have really beautiful stories about folks that were their neighbors who were helping them out, you know, getting groceries in or like their car broke down and they could like drive them to get their car fixed. And that built a relationship. By the time we ended that conversation, we asked them again. So do you believe that we should expand healthcare? And do you believe that undocumented immigrants should get healthcare? We saw a nine to 11% increase in support for healthcare with the intersection of immigration, just by having deep listening conversations on the doors where we were poking holes in some of this anti-immigrant bias that they were getting in other places. We also saw some really beautiful um, effects where when we gave them a survey afterwards that looked at other benefits for immigrants that they actually had a bump rate. So then, you know, their, their, their positive belief in immigrants should have food security immigrants are not a burden on their economy like all these things actually expanded and so that that was really beautiful to see the last thing i'll say too around the the, the weaponization of healthcare right now with the reopen movement and covid right um we're seeing white supremacists use covid and um what is happening in healthcare as a way to recruit into neo-confederate and neo-nazi spaces right they're saying um, you know, we should be reopening because uh, this disease is, you know, um, not as bad. But they're saying that now because they're realizing that COVID has a disparate impact on black and brown communities. And they don't want the actual, um, when it was sort of a solidarity message of let's all be in this together, it's because they thought it was the same hitting white communities the same, right? But now we're seeing that because of these systemic health disparities due to race, more black and brown people are getting impacted by it. They're like, oh, let's reopen and then let's use these myths to then recruit into our side. And again, so we've been fighting that. We've been doing webinars on that. We're um, really trying to show that belief system that is being prevalent right now. And, and again, so when you're fighting on healthcare, you're fighting on racial justice at the same time in, in just these two ways. And you're going into those um, those sprays, so to speak, um, with that human lens, it seems like, um, bringing it right back to seeing people um, as people building building community in a real in a real sense. Lenora, I saw you nodding a lot um, as Bridget spoke. Yeah, I, because I, I really love her message, especially when reaching to the people and talking to the people and listening to the voices. That's one of the things that resonates loudest with me. But also we, um, and, and I just, anyway, uh, what I wanted to say is that the connection, because uh, we address um, health through housing. And the research on that is clear. 
that that is very that biological, chemical, physical, you know, whether there is injury related, those are aspects that really influence the health of the residents in the home. And we focus most importantly on children because when it comes to lead paint, even in very small amounts, lead can be cause cognitive deficits in children. It, I mean, it has behavior problems. And once those um, damages are done, once you know the, the body um, has those damages, they can't be reversed. And so you start at a deficit, you start your life at a deficit because you're not able to operate at whatever your full potential was going to be. And lead in housing, when you look at it, um, the morbidity in disease is so much higher. Um, if you're African American, um, even as it relates to um, African American and poor children have the highest rates of elevated blood lead levels, um, more than um, non-Hispanic whites, non-Hispanic blacks, more than um, whites. Uh, and so those levels, what we try to, those levels, um, even though they may not be high, the, they cause very severe and critical health detriments for a child. And so what our agency does is we try to go in, we go in, we teach residents how to protect their families from exposure to lead and other indoor um, air contaminants. And we also try to train community workers so that they also are informed and contractors. So we a resource that allows the community, the broader community, to protect children and families from potential exposure um, to lead-based paint. And if you can protect the health of a child, then that gives them the opportunity to at least navigate a lot of these systemic change um, problems that, they, that are policy. It allows them to at least navigate them from a holistic approach, an inner holistic approach. So I um, I could not agree more, Lenora. the The idea of a holistic approach, um, and gosh, just going back to the healthcare, uh, Moms Rising looks at. Um, the idea that, you know, families don't exist in a vacuum. And um, often, you know, when one family is, um, when a family is facing, you know, one issue, they're, they're you know, one issue, whether it's um, limited access or lack of access to health care, you know, they're, they're, offer, they're often suffering um, in, in another area. And um, we really work hard on, you um, ensuring that, you know, we, we say families don't live in silos. And we, we want to sort of walk, we, we work on a broad range of issues, um, mainly centered around economic justice. But because we don't live single issue lives, we, we, um, we try to focus on the wide range of issues that families face. Um, and one that's, you know, one um, that's really, uh, you know, COVID unfortunately has shown a very bright light on um, the disparities that have already existed. Um, and, uh, you know, when we talk about um, uh, the effect of, of white supremacy on, um, on the reopening campaign, you know, when we look at who is most, who is directly affected, um, we see that it's black and brown folks who've had to return because they're the essential mm -hmm. workers. Um, we see that um, it is folks mostly um, in rural communities um, who are having to turn, return to work because um, they don't have the option of, of working from home. So, um, you know, we, we're seeing this and so so when we when we don't have policies um, that are you know what are you supposed to do if you're if you think if you suspect that you're sick with COVID you're supposed to stay home right well what happens when you don't have that ability to stay home because you don't have access to paid sick days or 
um, or you don't have a position um, in which um, one that that option is even offered, or or two that that's even um, that that's even something you could do. So we we've been fighting for for paid sick days for a while. We know that um, the majority of workers in North Carolina do not have access um, to paid sick days. Um, and even those who do don't necessarily have um, access to paid sick days to care for a loved one. Um, they can only use the, the you know those days to care for themselves. So what happens when um, their child gets sick, um, and and who is supposed to stay home with that young child while you know mom or dad are are, are off to work? Um, and you know so we, we we really look at those sort of you know policy issues. Um, so paid sick days and the lack of access to that. Um, also, um, the lack of ac access to paid family medical leave. Uh, we know about 12% of North Carolinians have access to paid family medical leave. And when you look at where that access falls, um, it mainly falls with folks who are in the tech industry and in the banking industry. Um, that's where the majority of it falls. Um, about 5% of low wage earners um, uh, um, have access um, to, pay, to pay family medical leave. And so, you know, the way that works out is that mostly retail and service industry jobs, which is, of course, again, disproportionately represented um, by black and brown folks, as well as women. Um, and so these are the folks who are consistent not having access um, to these you know, basic um, policies to be able to take the time um, if they're sick um, or if they have a family member to care for a family member who's sick um, to take that time off. And, you know, what happens is that um, lawmakers often don't realize this. Um, they don't know that one in four moms are returning to work um, within 10 days of giving birth. You know, when most of our lawmakers are white men, they don't know, they don't understand. And so we really work hard to make sure that we are uh, bringing the voices of parents um, and families to lawmakers and really sharing with them what, um, you know, what um, individual families are, are, are really facing, what it's like um, when you're living um, in northeastern part of the state and you have limited access um, to, um, to prenatal care. And now, you know, you're looking at, unfortunately, um, you know, potentially um, a, a, a preterm delivery. Um, and what does that look like? And what does that look like to meeting um, health care, access to health care when 50% of our um, um, of new babies are born um, on Medicaid because of the lack of access to, to health care. You know, you know, what does that mean? And then what does that mean when that mom now has to go back to work and her baby's in the NICU? And what does that mean when now we're in the middle of flu season because that happens um, and add COVID on top of that and mom doesn't have any access to sick days? You know, what are the spillover effects? What, is that, um, what does that mean for that mom? What does that mean for those health, health outcomes for that baby? What does that mean for health outcomes for the remainder of her family and her ability to, you know, to, to, um, to, to, you know, fully support that family and, and, and dad's ability to fully support that family. You know, what does that mean when we don't have access to these, to these various policies? Wow. Yeah, just the idea, um, the ideas that all of you have shared about um, foundationally, the things that your organizations, your community organizations are already doing, um, already dismantle racism, right? Um, what are, are there any other specific things um, that you feel um, that you've partnered in, um, in working with your community organizations? Um, any other specific things you do to fight racism within those organizations? I mean, I'll just say, you know, in my heart and in my soul and just, um, it's real that the people united will never be defeated. Like the only way we are going to advance as a people, as a state, as a country is by community organizing and getting more people involved in making the real solutions that we know we need. And so I think that any, like all the good things we can point to, um, all the fights, it's because community organizing has happened to make it happen because the system as it's set up right now, it doesn't want to give up its power. It wants things to remain the same. And um, so uh, 
when I think about fights in community organizing and other victories that we've been able to win in terms of um, advancing racial justice, you know, I do think about um, some of the work that we're doing in Alamance County around um, ending cash bail and, um, and the intersectionalities with mass incarceration and healthcare and race, you know, I'll, they're all there, but, you know, I think about some of our members came into um, the chapter in Alamance as folks that had been through the criminal injustice system. They had been people who were held um, pre-trial and didn't have money. As you know, working folks, we know that like it really ought, you are a paycheck away mm -hmm. from going into an emergency because who who has savings? Who can have savings right now? You know, and so folks wanted to work on ending cash bail. So what the group decided to do is that they wanted to form a bail fund so they can start bailing folks out who were languishing in Alamance Detention Center because they didn't have sometimes $75, you know, $100, $500 to get out before trial. Um, and they also wanted to work on um, sort of pre-trial release policies that would allow for um, even at the start for nobody to be held if they were meeting criteria that showed that they had economic hardship. And, you know, and to me, these are victories. We have freed people now in Alamance um, whose real lives have been impacted because what we know is that when you are stuck in jail and you have a job that maybe you will lose your job because you are stuck there. And if you lose your job and that was where you got health care, well, then all of a sudden, bam, you're in this cycle now, right? And so all of these things get connected. So freeing people is a victory. And then we did just get an order, um, a pre-trial change um, in the court system so that, again, if you are showing economic hardship that you won't um, have to go through any kind of bond proceedings. And to me, that power of community organizing, that's people who have lived it came together, said we want to be able to do these things. And it's policy, but it's like policy plus. Mm -hmm. Because I also think community organizing has to meet people where they're at. And a lot of the time where people are at are they need direct support with help with food. You know, in the West, we do work around ending overdose. So people need direct access to syringes. Um, people need, again, some real support. So I think it's policy plus. Um, and again, I think once people get their mind on what, you know, freedom looks like, ain't no stopping us. Mm -hmm. I agree. Awesome. I think I, I just want to put a little point in here. And um, it's not so much that I was directly involved with any of the activities, but one really, really strong and recent community organizing, sort of organic organizing activity was in public housing in Durham. So uh, at the end of last year, there was um, carbon monoxide discovered in one of the pu public housing authorities. And it ultimately resulted in the housing authority relocating hundreds of families into local hotels. And, and they did it just like that. Mm -hmm. No forethought, no strategy, no anything. So now you have kids who can't necessarily get to school in a um, convenient way. You have families in a room a mother with two or three children in a hotel room and they're stuck there. They can't cook food. They don't have food available to them. Um, and so the goal, so the immediate thought was get them out. But there was no thought given to how are we going to feed them? How are we going to make sure they can get to school and to work? How are we going, how, how can we do this without disrupting their lives terribly and the the policy makers didn't think strong enough and and well enough about that beforehand so that the residents begin bringing up these issues and these concerns they had to piecemeal a response together and that response and the solution that they came up with had to be uh, 
at least two times as costly as it would have been if they had taken the time to uh, a quick time just to strategize about how to do that. One of the benefits of it, um, so the communities already had strong leadership, but one of the benefits of it, and a lot of times this is what happens when there's a crisis in a community, mm -hmm. the leaders rise yes. and you create leaders in those moments. And that's what happened in these instances. Those leaders, they took charge, um, they were accountable to the residents and they weren't getting money. There was literally one person um, who, for that community, took on the mantle to, and I don't know if it's appropriate to say her name, but she took on the mantle of being a community warrior so that her residents, her community, the members, her neighbors could suffer as little as possible during this inconvenience um, that was created because of a housing issue that never should have been there in the first place. Mm -hmm. Public housing, they are responsible for housing the least of these. And they gave, and, and through that process, it was, it was, it became known to the whole community and abroad that they had rats in the apartments, roaches, that their suit, that their plumbing wasn't adequate. You could be in the kitchen and the and sewage from the um, bathroom could come down into the kitchen. And they have people, families, mothers and children living in these environments, in these homes. And that came to light. Now, as they were throwing all of this money on this one housing authority to try and put band-aids on the housing issues that existed, mm -hmm. residents from the other housing community say, wait a minute now, there are problems in our housing communities as well. And we don't want you to not give those families the resources they need, but recognize that we need those same resources here in our community as well. Um, and so through that whole entire process now, we're into um, the new year and I do, well, I think it was probably April beginning in from November or December until April, all of the families were back um, into their homes, but the homes weren't made whole. Mm. So they're out of the, the limited and confined space, mm. but the spaces that they are in are not the spaces that will allow those families to thrive. And you think about it, everybody's mentioned COVID. Now you're stuck in those environments mm -hmm. that weren't healthy to start with. And now you can't even really get out and um, move around. And again, if you're thinking about, um, what's the word that get essential? Workers. If you are thinking about essential workers, a lot of times they're going to live in public housing. And a lot of times they don't have, like um, Tina was saying, they don't have the resources to stay home. So they risk exposing other family members because they must go out. They have a job. I have three children that are essential workers. And so many complaints, so many complaints. My daughter-in-law was in childcare and her um, co-teacher was tested positive for COVID. Her resource was to either come to work as usual or stay home 
for 14 days on your own dime. You're not going to get paid for it. Or you, and you have to pay your own for your own testing. We're not going to pay for that. And so these um, are some of the challenges that our, our residents face. And as they face these challenges, the, the, one of the benefits, it's sad, but one of the benefits is that you do create these community organizers. You, com you create community leaders mm -hmm. out of these tough um, crises. My daughter-in-law will be speaking to the um, news at the end of next week, um, and it should air the first part of August. But, you know, she was, she didn't appreciate the treatment she received, and she fought against it. And that's the other thing. You have to be willing to fight against it. You have to be willing to say, no, this is not right, and I will not stand for it. I think that's so important, Lenora, um, how that adversity um, kind of um, brings up um, leaders, just as you said, and how um, Bridget talked about that policy plus those community um, leaders feeling empowered despite their situation um, from the support that they have from each other. It's, it seems like that's too that plus piece. Mm -hmm. um, where I'm, yes, Tina. I'm sorry, I'm determined in this moment that um, that the, the community leaders that are rising up, um, that, that we, um, our only choice from here is to build back better. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a, a term, a, a national disaster, um, FEMA related term. Um, but I mean, we are in the middle of a national disaster. Um, and our, our only, you know, like I said earlier, you know, there has been a really bright light shown on um, the disparities um, that exist. And um, I strongly believe that our only way forward is to, to build back better, that we, we can't leave these holes. Um, Lenora, the families that you described who are, you know, in the midst um, of um, living in, in, in conditions that are less, less than ideal, they, they should not be there. We, we can mm -hmm. only go forward by building back better. And, and I appreciate the, um, the folks that are standing up in this moment to, to do that. Um, and I think, I think it's, you know, all of our jobs um, to, to ensure that um, those voices keep being pushed to the forefront and also to, um, to make sure that the folks who are rising up have the tools that they need and the support and the backbone that they need um, to, to, to continue to push forward. Um, and, you know, I think that's a really critical part of at least, you know, where I don't want to speak for everybody here, <laughs> but where I see my role um, sort of going forward is ensuring that, um, that, that folks do have the tools that they need because, uh, and, and the resources that they need going forward. So in light of um, that, um, Tina and Lenora and Bridget, please share um, what are, what is one or two key things that organizations need to know if they're looking to build their capacity for community engagement or community organizing? Yeah, I'll, um, so for me, I think in the years, it's been like 20 plus years that I've been doing community organizing. And, um, and we already touched on some of the strategies I think are important that are staples. And number one, and not necessarily in order, but one of them is to listen. Listen to what the community has to say, because if you don't listen, to what they are saying and you don't try to operate from the perspective that is important to them they won't be there mm -hmm. and then that would be another aspect give them a reason to want to be there i think covid uh, provides a reason for people to want to get involved because they want to get out of the house um, and if we can create, I know there are a lot of um, funding sources out now trying to test um, residents, especially low-income residents. They want to do surveys and find out more information. 
but that's helping you. What are you providing that will assist these families that you are going to test? You providing a tangible, maybe even sustainable benefit to the people who you seek to gain additional data. You, you really must listen to them. And my other thing is passion. If you're going to do community organizing, you have to care about people. And then that, um, well, I'll just say one of my favorite books talks about that, you know, and I had mentioned it earlier, but um, the story um, is being told by the king who's also the protagonist. And he's like, well, whatever you do for the least of these, mm -hmm. then that is this, what you're doing to me. And I think when you do community work, then you definitely have to have a passion for people. Yes. Yes, I um, could not agree with you more. I mean, at very much, uh, Lenora, is where I was going to go with, uh, is you have got to trust people and you have got to go to the people. And I know in COVID it makes it harder, but I do think um, there has been this sort of like shrinking of our movement. You know, it's like people are not, I feel like right now there's like, um, a way in which we're not actually trying to talk to real folks and actually like be uh, out and trying to get more people involved. It's sort of become this like small choir, you know, like you have to talk like me and think like me and like, and therefore like if I, if I, if you sound a little different or if you look a little different, like, you know, it's, it's like, no, no, no. And I actually think we really need to expand the pie and really look at um, who should be involved but isn't because maybe we're not going there. You know, we're not knocking on those doors. We're not uh, going to those churches. And like, I just feel like we have got to be where the people are. We've got to be listening to people and really like empathy and love and um, following the folks because they, they do know, um, we know. Um, what again are the real solutions and so um, uh, yeah I just think that is really key right now to uh, building a bigger progressive movement that can really affect the change that we all so desperately need and I, I the only thing I will add <laughs> because both of you um, said it so well is um, gosh Brigitte I want to go back to your um, point of scarcity um, in this moment don't the fear of scarcity is real and it doesn't need to be um, and um, um, those in power who want to maintain the power um, are going to continue to fuel fuel that um, fuel the excuse me fuel those fears um and um and and we we know that we are better together um and we know that's the only way forward and so we we cannot let um them continue to sow division um and to to fuel those fires because they're they're real um and they will continue to fan the flames and and we know that we are all better together lifting each other up um and looking out for our neighbors and that's going to be really key as we continue to move forward Well, thank you, ladies. All of um, the wisdom you shared um, is so valuable, um, and I'm really grateful for the work that you're doing in your communities and really um, for the people of the state. Um, are there any other thoughts um, that you'd like to leave with um, all of our viewers? Um, I'm inspired. I want to learn. It's like I want to just kind of sit at y'all's feet and um, absorb more of um, your community organizing wisdom and prowess. But um, is there anything else that you'd like to share? If I could add one thing, because uh, we've mentioned COVID several times, and I really would like for um, people to 
look at COVID and not dismiss the changes that can happen. Um, I think we, over the weeks, we, well, I've just been a part of a community that complains about education and that they don't teach black history in schools. Um, and now we have an opportunity to retransform what that looks like. I think we have, from, and especially in low wealth communities, we don't have any understanding of how to build family wealth. I think this is an opportunity to look at that because not only the traditional marginalized people are feeling this pinch, but the broader community is feeling it as well. And so thinking about community health, I mean, community wealth is also um, a very important tool as well as economic developments. Um, I think, and I don't know the exact numbers, but they say in the white community, a dollar might um, pass around, let's just say 10 times before it leaves that community. Uh, in, a, in a black community, that dollar won't even circulate one time before it leaves the community. And so now is the time for us to re-examine while we're home and on our computers more, let's take this time to look at ways to come out on the other side of COVID with stronger opportunities, stronger lifestyle opportunities for ourselves and for our community. Yes, ma'am. Um, couldn't agree more. And I, I, yeah, to me, it's like right now, what I think about the world that we're living in is that there is so much pain um, that we're seeing um, with the way that our criminal justice system is set up, our yeah. environment, clearly COVID. But like, this is to me one of the most um, amazing moments I know in my lifetime. And I feel like for a very long time, like watching the amount of transformation that is rapidly happening mm -hmm. because of the fruit of organizing that has happened for decades. Like it's like things are really moving right now and there's tremendous opportunity. And it's like, I just want people to be as bold as they can be as courageous as they can be like despair is real but like we cannot let fear or apathy come in in this moment because there's actually like big changes that we are making you know looking at what started in cleveland and saying that racism was a public health crisis and then the city government there started to think about redistributing um resources to to address that that's now happening in cities across the country mm -hmm. Asheville just passed a reparations ordinance thinking about how they're going to move money and be able to address the systemic racism that has impacted black and brown communities up there. Like those people in the streets and yes, COVID safe, but like the people in the streets have like really pushed these bold demands that we're, we're watching now. And I'm just like, let's keep going. We are at a turning point where if we aren't doing this, the right will yes. win mm -hmm. and like we got to get some people out of office we got to get some people in office we got to redistribute money we've got to you know there's just we, we, we could do it all like let's just believe in it and then we'll make it happen so opportunity amen I want to leave with that. <laughs> amen amen <laughs> Well, again, I want to thank you ladies um, for coming and sharing on this session of how to center race equity and community organizing. Um, we'll be convening live for Q&A. So um, again, thanks for your wisdom and knowledge and um, we appreciate you. Thank, thank you. you for having me. Thank you so much. All right, wow. Thank you, Tina, Lenora, Bridget, uh, for sharing with us. Um, we only have about five minutes left um, before the end of our session here. And um, I don't know that I see any other questions that have popped up in the last few minutes. So I would just like to kick it over to you all, Tina or uh, Lenora or Bridget, if y'all have any, you know, anything else you'd like to add these last few minutes.
Or for me, I was re-inspired <laughs> listening <laughs> to our conversation um, and um, ready to get to work. Um, we, I mean, just in the in the chat, um, several and several folks shared um, some experiences that, that, that they're having and some experiences that they've seen. And um, we 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 have to hold decision makers and lawmakers to account, and um, we have to keep continuing to lift up these voices. Um, so even more invigorated to do so. Yeah, um, I will just uh, completely echo Tina and Lenora. Uh, I feel like we really are building something pretty powerful and strong together. And um, that the more that, again, we just keep pushing, the more we're going to get. And so um, looking at every challenge as an opportunity uh, and continuing to not only be building people power, but coalition power and just connecting each other, organizations, people together, getting larger, getting bolder, like that's how we're going to win. And so, yeah, just want to keep giving people that energy because I know I've been getting it from y'all. So thank you so much for having me on the panel today. Absolutely. Miss Lenora, I don't know if you are able to chime in or, or wish to. All right, well, I, I will just say too that NC Child, we want to do whatever we can to help facilitate more of these conversations and more importantly, more actions that um, are, are community or community led and community organizing. And so, you know, we hope to continue to take y'all's lead at Moms Rising and Down Home and Sea and Peach and Durham and many of the other organizations that are on this webinar right now and try to be a resource and a link however we can within that. And, um, you know, hopefully linking that as we all want to see it linked, obviously, to systemic change, you know, and racial justice within this system um, and being, being, hopefully being a cog in that wheel, you know, from NC Child's perspective, uh, very much we, we want to continue to try to do that in, in moving forward. So we want this to be a continued conversation and path of action and the organizations, Moms Rising, Down Home NC, Peach, they have actions that people can get involved with um, ways to learn more, things to do, and we will do our best to connect everyone that wants to learn more and do more. Um, so without any further ado, I think there may be one other thing in the chat, all for Miss Queen down in Fayetteville. Hello, long time no see, Miss Queen. Hope you're doing well. Um, and uh, I will just say thank you all on this panel. Thanks for all of you who joined us and look forward to seeing you in one of our final sessions for 2020 Kids. Have a wonderful day.